So we thought, well, really it means more than, than just the saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Of course, one part is that you make it halal by just saying a prayer over it. But that's one part of it. If the animal has reached that point of slaughter and there are a lot of things wrong with it, then it wouldn't be halal. We looked at the, the factory farming industry and 99% of all the halal chicken you're eating actually comes from factory conditions. It's not farming anymore. They're rearing 20, 30, 40,000 birds in single units with no lights. Uh, the animals never see daylight. I mean, that's a thought in itself that all the chicken that you've ever eaten has never ever seen daylight in its life. So that can't be right. But in addition, they're using a breed that grows very quickly in about four weeks. It's a sort of monster breed that's been inbred and played with so much that within four weeks it's ready to eat. It can only achieve that firstly because of the breed, secondly because they're kept in very close conditions. As I say, thousands upon thousands of birds crammed together in dark sheds. If you turned up the lights in those sheds, the birds would peck each other to death because they're at such close quarters. But another point is that they would all catch disease very quickly because they're so close to each other. So they're drip fed antibiotics from day one right the way through to the day that they're slaughtered. Now they've banned growth hormones, which previously they could use, but some of you will know antibiotics work as a growth promoter. So if you're on a regular course of antibiotics, you will put on weight very quickly. So in addition to stopping contagion in the houses, it actually makes the birds bloat and get very fat. Now, Imagine looking at your own children, the slow development of your children, their bones, their muscles, their whole uh, being develops slowly over the years. If you actually speed that up so fast, what you're doing is you're not having properly developed muscles, properly developed bones. So a lot of the birds that you're eating will be taken from the abattoirs, taken from the factory conditions with broken limbs, with uh, weak bone structure, a lot of chronic pain, and then they're slaughtered. So I think the simple point that we realized is that it can't be halal to eat something that's been haram throughout its whole life. So if we don't go back a step and actually think about the way the animals are living, we're missing a very important point. And if you look in the Quran, it mentions actually the word halal almost on every occasion with the word tayyib, which means natural, pure, organic, healthy. It has a lot of connotations. So if something's not being reared in a natural, healthy way, no amount of Bismillah Allahu Akbar at the end of its life is going to make it halal. You know, we have to realize that. And that led us to think, well, we can't leave that responsibility upon others. At the end of the day, we have been given a task of being responsible for what we do in this world. And the Quran again mentions this term khilafa. It says that we've been made khulafa fil ard. We have placed humans as those responsible on the earth for what they do. So each of us are responsible for our actions. And the world has become so complicated that those actions, it's not clear what they are. We walk into Primark, we buy a cheap t-shirt. We didn't physically force a Bangladeshi child to stitch that in terrible conditions, but we sort of know that's why it's £1.50. When we buy chicken for £1.50 or we go to the local kebab kid or whatever and we buy the cheap meat that some of our kids are eating three times a day, we know there's something wrong. It can't be that cheap. You know, We can't be selling a bird for £12 and they're selling one for £1.50 without something serious going on. It's easy for us to then ignore that and actually just buy the cheap thing, buy the Primark t-shirts, use the plastics, not think about the waste that we're producing. But ultimately, you're responsible for that. We can't blame Trump. It's fun to blame him, but we can't really do that. We can't blame other people. We can't blame our community. We can't blame our leaders. Ultimately, that term khilafa is an individual responsibility. And the Quran emphasizes that on the day of judgment when you're called to account for what you've done. It's no good saying so-and-so made me do it. The system made me do it. We're each individually responsible for what we do. So that was really the premise we started with. Um, and we thought, well, for a number of other reasons, um, we can do something ourselves. So we gave up our day jobs, we started the farm, and 16 years later, we're still here, which is good. Um, it also made us realize, and what I'll try and emphasize to you, just three simple things to take away with you. It's not just about the meat that you're eating, it goes beyond that. So obviously one thing is thinking about your food and where your food comes from. The diet, what you're eating, etc. Um, and in terms of food production, an important point, again, there's a hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he said, <laughs> <"Adeen> <laughs> Your religion is your social interaction. 
So you choose who you interact with. When you're buying your cheap chicken, you're buying into that system, you're buying into the factory farming, you're buying into the halal meat millionaires that were up and down the country in Birmingham and, and London who are making a lot of money out of the suffering of animals. And you're buying into that. That's your community. You've chosen to be part of that community. When you go to Primark and you buy the cheap t-shirts, you've chosen to be part of that capitalist community that's emphasizing cheap labor, exporting labor abroad, and poor working conditions. Um, on the contrary, if you do what hopefully some of you will start to think about is you source your food uh, responsibly, you think about where you're buying from, you're supporting simple farmers like us doing what we're doing. So we're building a community, we're building a relationship with our customers, which is actually taking responsibility. So at Deen Mo'amala, your religion is your interactions. It's not really your aqeedah, it's not all these debates about political issues, but it's actually much more simple than that. It's really about how you live your lives, how you treat your family, how you source your own food, how you act responsibly in the community. Um, so the first thing is where you get your food from. For example, we, we sell our produce at a local farmer's market. That farmer's market is full of a lot of people like us, not all Muslims, some who are uh, starting to grow organic veg, there's an organic dairy near us, and there's a whole little community of people doing that sort of job. And then linked into that are the people that come and buy from them, like yourselves or local Oxford people who are buying the veg. So all of you go away from here maybe and think, where do we get our food from? What sort of veg are we buying? What sort of produce are we buying? Um, if you're going to make any changes in your life just for your own health benefits, certainly chicken is the worst abused animal and contains the most amount of antibiotics and chemicals. Following on from that, obviously eggs, which then concentrate all those impurities. So if you're going to do anything, switch from the standard that you're buying to something like free range or organic, particularly in terms of chicken. But also vegetables. If you're buying cheap vegetables, think about where they come from. See if there's a local farmer's market you can go to. Actually talk to the producers who are making that and go and visit their farms and see what they do. So that way you create and you support people doing the right thing. Um, after food, we thought it's not just about the food, it's about the environment. So we started to think about planting trees. We've planted about 5,000 trees over the whole farm. Um, we've tried to live sustainably on the farm, recycling our waste and other products. So I hope you'll go away thinking just not only about your food, but also about the energy consumption. We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about how the farmhouse is kept warm in the winter. Um, and your waste, hopefully we'll talk about how we're controlling a lot of the waste on the farm. And I'm sure you'll all be very pleased to know that when you visit our compost toilets, everything you deposit with us will be naturally recycled and composted on the farm. Um, so we'll talk about those things. So as I say, if you go away thinking about where your food comes from, what sort of energy you're using, and what sort of waste recycling you're doing, and maybe make a change in your lives in whichever way you can. Not everyone has to become a farmer. It's quite a difficult job. Um, but I think you all need to at least maybe make a start in thinking about what we're doing on this earth and which direction we're going. Not Islam is a very green religion. It has so much in it which talks about this concept of responsibility, care for nature, and fundamentally all of creation comes from one source. We know that Allah created everything, but Allah says we can't understand Allah, we can't see Allah directly in, in Surat al-Ikhlas. There is no comparison that we can make to Allah. So we can't actually visualize Allah, but we're told to look for Allah in the signs of his creation, in the Ayatullah. And those signs are all around us and we're part of that. But we're the only one that is actually capable of making a choice of how we interact with that environment. So I think it's a really fundamental point about how we behave in this world. So this guy is going to fly back in. <laughs> off we go. And we're going to head off and see some more things around the farm.